This is part one of a two-part reminiscence on tube testers. I say reminiscence because I'm not going to be looking at the circuit diagrams or doing refurbishment or any of that kind of thing. I'm really just going to be comparing the tube testers over the years from the 30s to the 70s. The collection you see in front of me is uh, primarily the emission tube testers that I own. Starting on the far right over there is a unit in the back that was built in 1939. Ahead of it, right here, is one that actually dates to the early 30s. And I'm going to start with those two and then we'll proceed through the uh, emission testers you see down here. Eventually we'll look at uh, some of the tube testers from the 70s like that Syncor back there. And in the middle we'll look at some of the popular kit built uh, tube testers from the 19s, primarily the late 1950s into the 1960s. So I'm doing this in two parts because I don't, for one thing, have room on the table for the mutual conductance testers. Also because the emission testers were by far the most popular. And by going through these, you can see much of the evolution of tube testers. Then we will get to the mutual conductance, which were considered to be superior tube testers in the day, and even today for matching tubes and other things. But as I'll point out as I go along, none of these would actually test a tube and guarantee it would work in a circuit. They gave you an indication, in some cases a better indication than another tester, but none of these would actually verify that a tube would work in a circuit. So let's move on and start with these uh, testers on the far right over here, these two oldest ones, and we'll talk a little bit about them and then move on to the next set. This is the oldest tube tester that I own. It is made by Dayrad, which is actually, uh, they call themselves the Radio Products Company of Dayton, Ohio, and DAYRAD stands for Dayton Radio. I believe that Dayton Radio existed before 1935 when this uh, unit was built. But by 1935, this was a subsidiary of the Bendix Aviation Corporation. So this was a basic uh, tube tester of the day. You may notice that it uh, will use 4-pin, 5-pin, 6-pin, and the 7-pin and an 8-pin. Now the 8-pin is the first octal socket. You notice none of the miniature types nor the loctal types are tested on this one because they were not available in 1935. If you'll notice it has a very, very tiny roll chart. There are only about 100 tubes listed on this roll chart. And most of them are the early two-digit tubes, like the 80 or the uh, 79 and the 83 and so on. It uh, was a fairly basic tube tester, but it also included the ability to measure voltages and currents. And you could set that up with these controls. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, that was a fairly popular configuration in the 1930s because it was thought that they could therefore use the meter for two purposes. That is, you could sell this to a radio serviceman and the, uh, when the tube tester wasn't being used, it could be used as a volt-ohm uh, milliamp meter. This unit works, although not very well, uh, it really needs some cleaning. I cleaned it up many years ago, probably uh, 10 years ago, but I noticed the other day when I got it out that the switches have gotten dirty again, so I probably, to be able to use this, would have to clean it up a bit. The next 
tester that I'd like to talk about is the one back there. This is a type 920, series 920, made by Precision Apparatus. Sometimes you'll see this Precision Apparatus later went under the name PACO, P-A-C-O. The features of this instrument are it would not only do the 4, 5, and 6 pin, as well as the 7 pin and the octal, but it also would do the new loctal tube types and the 7 pin and 9 pin miniatures. It bills itself as a dynamic electronometer. This was a typical marketing ploy to use words like dynamic or conductance to imply that this tester would do dynamic mutual conductance. It does not. It's just a basic emission tester. Large neon tube over here for testing shorts. Push buttons to set things up instead of the uh, toggle switches that you saw on the previous unit. And then you would set basically the filament voltage, the uh, circuit type, and then the load uh, and the sensitivity. The load generally was how much current to put through the tube and the sensitivity. Just like the day red we just looked at, this particular unit had the ability to measure voltages and other things. You'll notice there are some jacks here and another set of jacks here and there were settings on this and this that would allow you to use this unit as a volt ohm milliamp meter. Once again, tubes are on a roll chart. By this time, 1939, when this came out, the roll chart contains several hundred tubes. I think it's about 400 tube types listed on this tube chart. After World War II, there was a surge in servicing brought about because of the radio boom of the late 40s and the television boom of the uh, late 40s and 50s. That sparked an interest in low-cost test equipment and companies like Allied Radio in Chicago began to produce kits of test equipment. This is one of those kits. This is a night tube tester it's a, a Model 600. You may notice it, it has the typical uh, 4, 5, and 6 pin, as well as a, loct uh, a loctal over there, an octal here, and a loctal. Uh, it has the nine, 7 and 9 pin miniatures here. Roll chart. In this case, they were beginning to use these uh, toggle switches. They're multi-position, as you can see. You can, you can move them to three positions, up, down, and middle. Once again, you had a filament voltage and a load. You selected the type, and this control allowed you to adjust the line voltage. Once again, a simple emission tester. And the, this was built normally from a kit. You notice that in this particular case, the handle is on the top, and this is built as a stand-up unit. The one below it is the same unit, but made to lay flat on a bench. It also has a top cover, which I've removed, that allow you to close this up, and that's one reason why this one looks a lot dirtier than this one, because this one remains closed all the time. This one is essentially the same circuit as this one, same roll chart, uh, and the only difference between the two was this was put in a case that could be, uh, with a cover that could be closed. So, for example, if you uh, operated this on a uh, uh, workbench, this would be your most uh, useful configuration, but if you wanted your tube tester to sit up on a shelf, 
then you probably would buy the one that stands up. A competitor, uh, those were both built by Allied Radio under the name Knight Kit. One of the competitors of Knight was a company called the Electronic Instrument Company, or ICO. They made this tester, which directly competed with the uh, Knight 600. This is the ICO uh, 625. You'll notice it has a, a pretty substantial roll chart. Basically the same tube complements could be uh, tested. In this case, the one of the miniatures on, is on one side and one on the other, but otherwise it's basically the same layout as the Knight. The controls are the same. There's a filament and a, a, a shunt or a basically sensitivity control, an adjustment for the line, an adjustment or a switch for the tube type, and then of course push buttons, in this case for testing the uh, uh, shorts, the switches to turn it on, a shorts indicator down here in the corner. Uh, by the way, I don't think I showed you the uh, uh, shorts indicator on this unit, and this particular, the Knight 600, if I recall, it uses the meter to do uh, shorts testing. There isn't a separate uh, shorts light like there is on the uh, on the ICO. So these units, that is the ICO and the Knights, came out in the late 50s, mid 50s to late 50s, and were improved over the years, or I should say updated over the years. All of them are basic emission testers. There are improved testers, ICO and Knight, both made mutual conductance testers uh, that were considerably better in terms of they, they would test a tube under, under actual control conditions. But once again, none of these were really uh, the end all for, uh, for tube testers. And no tube tester could ever really do everything, including verifying uh, that a tube would work in a circuit. Uh, I'm at a point now where I'd like to uh, plug a book. It's not my book, it's uh, a book by a man named Alan Douglas that is called Tube Testers and Classic Electronic Test Gear. Pardon the, uh, the glare. And in this book are most of these testers. Now the Dayrad that we saw earlier over here is not in the book, but the uh, 620, uh, or the 920, I mean, uh, uh, made by uh, Peco, and these three testers are all in that book. So also are the testers that you see down here. This is a Lafayette emission tester, very inexpensive, and this kind of represents the epitome of cost cutting in uh, tube testers. This particular tube tester I think sold for a little over $20 in the uh, mid-1960s. An even earlier version of that is this unit, which was the first tube tester that I ever bought, a Lafayette. And you will notice on this one that it only has four tube sockets, just octal, loctal, and seven and nine pin miniature. But it also does include, rather novel for its time, a uh, socket for a new Vister. Once again, simple uh, emission tester. In this case, you only selected filament volts and the shunt or load, which is a, just a potentiometer. Uh, all of the selections were done, in this case, by slide switches, including the, the uh, shorts position and the quality position. If you watched my uh, restoration of the SX-62 uh, Halicrafters receivers, 
You will recall this tester, I showed it in there. I also think that I showed the use of one of these uh, slightly more modern testers. This is the improved version of the Lafayette. Once again, very simple. Difference is that by this time they had included a new Vista and a Noval uh, tube sockets. And you will notice that the number of switches went from uh, a total of 10 to a total of 12. And the, uh, instead of the top cap coming out as this one does from the, uh, from a grommet in the front panel, this one has a phone connector for the top cap and a switch that allows you to select the top cap. So with this switch and the 13 uh, or 12 other switches that you use for selecting the tube elements, you could do uh, a 13 element tube. Once again, filament voltage and load or shunt is the only uh, the only controls other than the setup switches. The unit next to it is almost identical. However, the circuit in this one for doing shorts has been modified to be slightly less sensitive. One of the problems with this tester here is it showed shorts on almost every tube on almost every element. It was very sensitive. I think it would sense uh, as uh, high as 10 or 15 mega ohms of, of resistance as a short and would turn on the shorts light. So in later production versions, they changed the circuit to make it slightly less sensitive and in essence went back to the circuit they had used in this uh, tester. In addition to updating the circuits in the tube tester itself, one of the most difficult jobs for uh, tube tester manufacturers was keeping their tube data up to date. By the time that this uh, Lafayette came out in the uh, late 1950s, or actually its predecessor, which I showed you earlier over there, tubes were being produced, new tubes were being produced uh, by the dozens. So each year would see the introduction of uh, several hundred new type tubes. As a result, the, they were forced to uh, update their tube charts. And the, the problem was that on tube testers like this ICO and the Knight that used roll charts, updating those roll charts was a major enterprise because you had to remove the roll chart and then install the new roll chart and get it to operate properly. It often would hang up and sometimes it would take half a day to install a new roll chart in one of these tube testers. When I first started out uh, helping out in a radio TV service shop, that was one of my jobs, was to install the uh, roll charts. Uh, <laughs> so I became pretty good at it, but I will tell you that it was an exasperating experience because most of the new roll charts would, uh, if you didn't install them exactly the right way with exactly the right tension on the chart and so on, they wouldn't work the first time and you'd have to take them out and readjust them and so on. So in addition to updating the uh, chart information frequently, and sometimes that had to be done every month or two, the, uh, you also had to produce a new roll chart and get those out to service uh, centers who were frankly a little bit miffed that their testers were going out of date so quickly and they had to subscribe to all of this update service. But that's a different story. About the same time that this Lafayette tester came out, the, uh, a company called Syncor, which uh, also built test equipment for the service industry, 
brought out this uh, TC-154. Uh, the TC-154 was one of Zencore's first uh, testers, once again, an only emission tester. And let me readjust the camera and we'll take a look at that. The TC-154 had a slightly different way of setting things up. It still had the filament control and the load control, but also it had what was called a setup control, and that basically controlled the, the conditions, as well as a second setup control that set the circuit. Notice that by this time, the number of tube socket types had gone up quite a bit. Uh, in addition, to take care of the different tube uh, types, some sockets were duplicated, like the octal sockets. And uh, a couple of the uh, these uh, nine pin sockets are duplicated, as are a couple of the seven pin sockets. There is uh, a new nine pin socket introduced here, and then some of the larger the sockets for the larger Noval and Compactron tubes. The setup manual for the Mighty Might was rather uh, extensive and was a lot easier to issue in this form. And you'll notice that by this time, which was the uh, uh, mid to late 60s, the uh, tester manufacturers had begun to go away from roll charts. They had proven to be very uh, problematic. Later, Syncor brought out what they call the hybrider. The hybrider, or the TC-162, was both a tube and transistor tester. Now, if you're familiar with the TF series that Syncor produced, the, like the TF-46, you'll recognize it has a similar push-button arrangement to this. The TF-46 was a transistor tester, and the hybrider was the, uh, sort, if you will, the trial uh, marketing of a transistor tester that used this new method of testing transistors. It's very handy because you don't have to know what the tube base or the uh, transistor basing diagram is, in other words, where the emitter, base, and collector are. You simply push these four buttons, and based on the readings you get, you know if you either have a good transistor or a bad one. But since we're focused more on tube testers here, notice that the controls on this one are slightly simplified, but essentially the same. That is, on here, the uh, selector selected what you were testing Whereas on the TC-154, the tests you were performing were uh, done by push buttons on the right. So on this tester, you would select whether you were testing for shorts or for emission, uh, etc. And then on this side, you set up to test for transistors. Filament voltage, a load, and a setup or circuit. Uh, type of circuit. The tube data once again was put out in a booklet form and once again these had to be updated. The original that came with this particular tester is missing probably because it was torn out at the time this new book, which is a later vintage than the tester itself, uh, came out. So, by this time, which is the 70s, there were uh, almost all of the televisions that were still being made with tubes were being made with compactrons, and this tester is one of the best emission testers I have found on uh, on the market. One reason is 
Syncor did a fair amount of optimization on these various circuit settings and so on. For most of the popular tubes of the 60s and into the 70s, especially including Compactrons and Novals and others of that vintage, this tester does about as good a job for emission testing of any that I have found. This is a Mercury Model 1101 tube tester. Notice that it has this plethora of tube sockets, a couple of seven pins, a couple of a whole group of nine pins, uh, octal and uh, noval and compactron. Notice that by this time, and actually uh, back as early as the uh, the Lafayette testers of the late 50s and early 60s, the inclusion of four, five, and six pin sockets, like on this uh, night tube or this ICO tube tester and the night that's next to it, had disappeared. No longer could you test these tubes from the 40s. Only tubes manufactured since the um, the 50s were included in testers like this one. Once again, the tube data came in a book and the book was reissued often several times a year. In the Mercury, the switch on the far right controls the uh, heater voltage and also turns on the uh, unit. The, uh, this switch selects essentially the ground and this switch selects the meter. So as, as in all emission testers, all the meter is really showing is what current is flowing in the tube. And for that purpose, generally the plate and all the grids were connected together and the cathode was connected to ground. So in essence, this switch selects the cathode this switch selects the plate, which connects that to the meter, and then the amount of current flowing through the tube would be shown on the meter. I have above it two other testers. One is made by B&K, and it is a uh, picture tube tester, or cathode ray tube tester. And above that is one manufactured by Syncor, the ZR70. I'm not going to talk about these, but they should be included when you talk about emission tube testers, because that's what these are. They simply test the emission of a picture tube. At any rate, I think I'm going to break off this video at this point and transition from emission testers, as you see here, to the the better quality testers called mutual conductance. So I'll set up for that and I'll include that though, but I think I'm going to put this out as part one and then I'll save the mutual conductance testers for part two. So have a good day. Stay tuned for part two.